You know I have to do it. New book, new book. It's time to start a new book. <laughs> yes, with the dance and everything, because if it doesn't make anybody else happy, it makes me happy. Now, and you won't get to do that for a while because this is going to be a bit. Now, there is much to do and less time to do it in with this chapter because in all honesty, and I debated on this just so you know, um, we could do an entire Sunday morning on what we call the prolegomena of Hebrews. So the stuff you need to know before you start the book. We could, we could do a whole Sunday on that. And then I started thinking about it going, I don't want to do that to you. You don't want me to do that to you. So I'm going to try and do like a Reader's Digest Micro Machines guy version of the introductory stuff to Hebrews. Does that make sense? Do you guys remember the Micro Machines commercial where the guy just sat there and talked really fast and you couldn't figure out what was going on? Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm going to try to avoid doing that to you. But more than likely, you're, de and again, everything I'm going to say about the book of Hebrews between now and when I say verse 1 is something that somewhere someone with a PhD in theology would argue about, okay? Just so you know. We're dealing in probabilities and what you consider to be most likely. So from here until I say verse 1, you are completely allowed to disagree with me and go, I think that's wrong. And I don't care. I just, I just don't, okay? So more than likely, you're talking about a book that is written down in the second half of the 60s AD. The theory on that goes that because of the amount of times it mentions temp the temple temple and temple rites, and it seemingly never talks about them in the past tense, means that they are an ongoing aspect of Israel, which would mean that the book has to be written down before 70 AD. And it would seem odd to write about so much of what goes on in the temple and in the inner courts of the temple without ever mentioning the fact, oh yeah, by the way, and the Romans burned that puppy down. So, since that would be odd, more than likely written pre-destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But again, there are people who would argue about that. The author is anonymous. So, I've said this before, I'm just going to say this again because this is how I'm going to treat it. Hebrews is a sermon of Paul written by Luke. Now, if you're asking me specifically when exactly Luke wrote it, I have no earthly idea. I wouldn't be shocked if Luke wrote it down after Paul had been executed by the Romans. And the reason why I say it's a sermon is because if you ever, for homework, if you'd like something to do this week, I'd like you to go home and read the book of Hebrews out loud like you're reading it as a story to children. And you'll realize very, very quickly that the flow, where the commas are, the dictate, the diction of it is very much in line with something that was delivered audibly and then was later written down. That's also one of the reasons why you'll have obscure and unnamed references, almost like someone's coming up with them off the top of his head. The reason why I say it's written by someone who didn't preach it is because there's obvious editorial editorializing in the book. And when we get to those, you'll see that in chapter 13. You'll see that in chapter 2. We'll try to make sense of that as we get to it. So there is obvious adjustment for someone who didn't deliver this material firsthand, but is very familiar with it firsthand. So it lines up very well with Pauline theology, the writing of it does not write up with the way Paul writes, and you'll see that as we start going through it. But the theology is Paul, and the writing does line up with something like Acts, when you see how it is written. So, It also is called a letter, but it's not really a letter. It doesn't have an introduction. It does have a conclusion, which is why I said it was written by someone who was trying to preserve information for the church, and that's part of the editorializing that we'll cover when we get to it. Beyond that, there are sweeping ideas in this letter. And again, I'm just going to call it a letter because even though it's not technically a letter, it's sent out as one. When I say sweeping ideas, I mean big chunks of information that kind of follow on the same eye, same concept and idea. And you know what my thought on that has always been. When the passage has one flow of thought, we try to keep that flow of thought in that passage intact. Hence why the random breaks that we have in chapters and things like that. The downside of that is because some of these sections are so sweeping, there is a lot that we could get into. <laughs> I'm going to try to make sure that we cover as much of that without losing everybody in the weeds. But that means we're going to miss going into tremendous detail on a lot of things. Don't be upset. There's books. 
and I trust you that if you're really just like into it, I'd be glad to give you some ideas for it and be glad to answer any questions you have. You know that. But we're not going to cover every little detail about every little thing because otherwise, chapter one would be like the, the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and I would hate me, and you would hate me, and your Bibles would be permanently creased in Hebrews 1, and nobody wants to do that. So we're going we're gonna to try to keep those big picture thoughts in play while making sure that we cover the big sweeping ideas. Because when I say big sweeping ideas, what Hebrews basically is at its core is a commentary on the law of the Old Testament. So how do you make sense of what the tabernacle was supposed to be? How do you make sense of the Levitical code? How do you make sense of the priesthood and the work of the temple of Israel? They wrote Hebrews because it helps to make sense for the Christian. What do we do? What's the point of that sacrificial system? How do we see it and make sense of it in light of the work of Christ? That's what Hebrews is going to do and lay out for us. Make sense? So if we can keep that in our minds and always keep that in the front of our minds as we go into stuff, as we get into the weeds on a few things, we won't lose that little beacon that kind of ties us to the road. So that's going to be part of our breadcrumb. Just like I warned you when we did Romans, you can't forget that God sits upon his throne and rules and reigns, because if you do, you're going to be in big, big trouble. That was kind of your little breadcrumb trail for Romans. For Hebrews, you have to remember, we're explaining how to see that Old Testament law and sacrifice in light of the fulfilled work of Christ. Remember that, and you'll be able to hop off the road, go down the side street, and then get back to where you belong. Sound good? Okay. From here on in, you're not allowed to argue anymore. <laughs> you know I kid. So, verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Yes, lots of different ways that God has spoken to his people. So you can find more examples than I'm going to give you. But he spoke directly to Adam and Eve. He spoke directly to Cain. He spoke directly to Noah. He spoke directly to Abraham. Just, you know, popped down and, hi, yeah, and then gives them the instructions and move from there. Jacob, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel. These guys didn't necessarily get the direct voice of God, but they got visions that then had to be explained by someone. So they saw the work that God was doing as it was given to them. Um, the prophets. Pretty much every prophetic book begins, well, every prophetic book begins with what? The word of the Lord came to such and such, and then they usually tell you like where they were standing when it happened. Meaning what? God communicating to his people through his prophets. Not the prophets being like, hey guys, I got an idea. You need to stop doing that. It was God going, prophet, go tell them to stop doing that. And this is what you should tell them. And by the way, write it down. Which is the important part, because ultimately, what's the way that God has universally spoken to all people? Scripture through the work of the Holy Spirit. Things like Jeremiah 36 is an example. Take a scroll, write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way. Then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. So ultimately, how do you know that God has spoken clearly in a way that you can verify and think through? The Holy Spirit inspires the writing of Scripture. That's going to be important because there's a comma right there, so this is not an end of a sentence, but that leads you to verse 2. In these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So from the very kickoff here, Hebrews' entire point is, do you want to understand what God has been telling his people? And the answer to that would be, yes, yes I do. Then you must understand Jesus. Because Jesus is the clearest, fullest, and final revelation of God. Which, by the way, doesn't contradict the Holy Spirit, universally speaking, because what's the Holy Spirit's job again? To testify to Christ. How many times have I said this? You get to the end of the Bible, what's your answer? Jesus. So the whole point of writing all of this stuff down is so that you would see Jesus. At the end of the revelation of God, the point of it all is the work of Christ, the person and the work of Christ. What Hebrews is starting off with is God speaks to people. He speaks in multitudes of ways. You want to understand all the ways that he's spoken? Understand who Christ is and what that means. Which, by the way, not a new idea if you're in Hebrews 1. John 1. 
There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world. The world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You want to under, and I mean, I've told you this before. You want to understand your prophets, you need to understand what first? Exodus. You want to understand what the prophets are calling you to? You have to understand the work of God in redemption as Israel would have seen that. Now, this is one of the reasons why you have so much of a reminder in the earthly ministry of Jesus of what? The prophetic calling. Because that's the corrective to the corruption that the system of Israel had brought about. So in other words, Jesus is calling you back to the prophets who's calling you back to the right understanding of salvation which is built upon who God is from the very beginning. Hebrews is just going, hey guys, you want to continue to understand them moving forward? You understand Jesus, because then you understand the prophetic calling, because then you understand the works of redemption. You understand the work of God from the beginning. The answer to understanding and seeing who God is and what he's doing is to see who Christ is and what he has done and what he is doing. Which, by the way, isn't that what we try to do on a regular basis? Isn't that the whole point? How does the work of Jesus relate to not just what he has done, but what he is doing and what he will do for his people? So, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions in many ways, in these last days, which, by the way, that's all the days from the time that Jesus ascended until Jesus comes back, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Verse 3. And he, talking about Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. This is the why for verse 2. So why can we say that Jesus is the fullest revelation of God because Jesus is the fullest revelation of God. You're never going to get a clearer understanding of God than, there he is! <laughs> I mean, imagine being in Israel, and here is God in flesh, and he's walking around and like, hi guys. Like, gee, I think I can start to understand God when I can look at him and talk to him. This is why you have Gospels, so that you can see what? The record of the people who did what? looked at him and spoke to him and understood the teaching. Not in the time, but later on. So if you continue on in John 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, this becomes important again because let's connect you back. When I say you want to understand Jesus' ministry, all those prophetic warnings, all those reminders of the teachings of the prophets, because the prophets received what? What does every prophetic book begin with? The word of the Lord came to dot, 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 dot. Well, if you're Israel, that's very, very important because in your history, Israel, when did you fullest, when did you the most fully and the most clearly see and understand God? If you're Israel, like you're just puttering around, it's 972 BC, you know, you're just, you know, you have the lambs live in your farm and your plots of ground. You're just trying to make sense of the world and you're going to the temple. You're going to the tabernacle. Let me see what year. Nine, yeah, 972, we wouldn't have a temple yet. You're going to the tabernacle. You want to understand who God is and what he is. What's the reminder of the clearest and fullest explanation for you of God? I'm going to have to get loud, aren't I? <laughs> it won't stop! <laughs> Exodus. When God does what? Comes down upon the mountain, and there's the glory of the Lord shining, and all of Israel rightly said what? You go talk to him! Because <laughs> I'm not going up there, which again, connects that to your prophets. What are the two prophets that most clearly see God? Or who are the two prophets that most clearly see God? One you know right off that. He sees the glory of the temple and Isaiah says what? Woe is me. Because I'm looking at God and I realize what? I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst an unclean people. I see the holiness of God. I see the non-holiness of me and I am scared. That's when you're extra scared. <laughs> Ezekiel sees the throne of God come down and he does what? Falls down like a dead man because he recognizes what? Holy God, unholy me, unholy people. And to quote the great theologian Linus, we're doomed. That's from the great pumpkin if you don't know. <laughs> so you see... 
the prophets getting this connection to the great revelations of God. If you're the church, you're going, wait, 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 wait. That's awesome. We can read about those. But wait, it gets better. So in other words, they're, they're, they're like bad infomercial guys from the 90s. They're, but wait, there's more. You have a clear revelation of who God is. No longer just the glory shining and the mountains shaking and the throne and people passing out. You had God walking amongst the people, doing his work, redeeming his people, preparing his kingdom, and it was understandable. You could ask questions. You could get your questions answered. It was almost as if the veil had been removed, but not completely because Jesus is shielding that glory. When they see the transfiguration, it's like... My bad. <laughs> and you even see that in the book of Revelation when John, who had walked with Christ, sees Jesus in his glory and does what again? Falls down like a dead man because he can't handle it because he recognizes again, holy God, unholy him. So Hebrews' starting point is that we have the fullest, clearest, and best understanding of who God is because God has condescended in the best possible way to explain himself to us. He has taken upon himself our burdens. He has taken upon himself our temptations. He has walked in the world that he has created, and he has shown us and told us what is right and good and how we should see the world. So from this point forward in Hebrews, that's the that's that's your foundation. So he's the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, going into verse 4, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And here the NASB does this excellent help because it capitalizes that he there to let you know that he's still talking about Jesus, which is very, very helpful because sometimes the pronouns get conf gets confusing in English. Greek pronouns don't get confusing because they're case sensitive so you can direct them back. In English we just have he, she, they and you're like, who are we talking about? I'm not an English major. I don't know. So capitalizing them helps make sure you didn't forget that you're talking about Jesus. Now this is your transition. We're still talking about Jesus but do you notice how we're talking about him now? Fullest, clearest revelation because he is God. God in flesh and he is better than the angels and has now a more excellent name. He is now part of the majesty and high, which again would be fitting for things like Philippians 2. Being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now begins the comparison portion of chapter 1, which is making a point. Hopefully we'll be able to, to follow this and make the same point. So, verse 5. We've got a better name. We're seated in the majesty. Verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, and in this point we're talking about God, did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Now, quick answer. To which of the angels did God ever say, you're my son and I am your father? The answer is none, which is instructive for power and place. So we're going we're to make a couple of points because these, this comparison gets made several times. And so we're going to try to highlight a different thing each time we go through it. Now, second thing that's going to be very important for us as we go through Hebrews, I know we've done this a thousand times, but... I don't remember everything I say, so I don't assume you do either. You see those capitals, right? You see that your Bible is not yelling at you by writing in all caps. I know that's what the kids do when they text, but that's not what's going on here. When you see all those caps, we have Old Testament quotes. So we have two Old Testament quotes. Without peeking, who knows where they came from? <laughs> I only knew, well, actually, yeah, if I thought about it, I think I'd have gotten the second one. These come from Psalm 2, my favorite Psalm, and 2 Samuel 7. So why are we quoting here? Because they're very, very, very messianic portions of the Old Testament. So Psalm 2 is a warning against the kings and the rulers of the earth to stop rebelling against God and instead to worship the Son of God before they are destroyed and the wrath falls. 2 Samuel 7 is part of that um, trail of covenants in the Old Testament. So depending on who you ask, there's a covenant with Adam. There is a covenant with Noah. That's the whole rainbow thing, not to flood the earth again. There is a covenant with Abraham. That's chapter 15 
scene of Genesis where the promise of a great nation and the warning against the slavery in Egypt. And then you have, ah, there's, sorry, there's a spot in my back that has decided it does not want to cooperate. And it's very annoying. <laughs> sorry, not that you asked. But if you're wondering why I keep doing this, I'm not, it's like something's stabbing me. Um, you have the promise of not really a covenant, but you have a promise of a prophet to come in Deuteronomy 18, but you do have a covenant with Israel made through Moses where they promise to keep the laws and the statutes that God has given and God promises to bless them. So if you're keeping score at home, we have a covenant with Abraham, well, a covenant with Noah, a covenant with Abraham, a covenant with Moses, and then you have a covenant with David, which is the second half here, a promise of a son who will rule on the throne forever, who will be disciplined by God if he goes astray and whose kingdom will have no end. So you have a dual purpose. You have Solomon who's going to rule, but you also have Christ who will end up fulfilling the promise that Solomon is. Now, why do I point all of that out? Because stop for a minute and just think about and realize what an angel is and what that means moving forward. So things like Jude 6. Angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just for the sake of argument, let's just say an angel walked in the back door. And I don't think like TV angels, not like the wings and the halo and the whole bit. But I mean like Old Testament, you know, angels are going to smack you around a little bit. How, how good do you feel about your chances of like getting that guy on the ground and subduing him for a minute? <laughs> I do not like your odds. I don't like my odds either. I don't like all of our odds. I mean, they basically look like a bad action movie, you know, where we, we all jump in at one time and all of a sudden we all go flying across the room. It's not going to end well. And yet when God goes, you're in jail now. As powerful as those beings are, what happens? They go to jail now. They are second to God. Now, why does that matter to Hebrews? Because Hebrews is making the point that Jesus, who is this full, clear revelation of God because he is God, means that the angels fall second to God. Now, that becomes important because the, there's a distinction problem that we have as people because, let's be honest, who do we like to elevate first and foremost? Us. us, which means whenever we see something that's like slightly better than us at something, what do we? We elevate that too. That's why. Do you remember the arguments? Well, oh God, how many of you would be old enough? Well, most of you would all be old enough to remember this. But if you saw it, do you remember the um, the Charles Barkley late eighties, early nineties? I'm not a role model commercial. Do you guys remember that one? Why was that such a big deal? Because we looked at basketball players and football players, and be like, tell us about your political opinions. You dribble. <laughs> like, I never really understood the football one because now, especially since we're finding out that they've all basically got like slight brain damage. <laughs> well, all of them at least have a little bit, you know, because so all these years we're asking football players their opinions on things and they've all been concussed 18 times. And it's like, you know, do we really want to be taking that advice? But why do we do it? Well, because he's big and tall and strong and handsome. And so therefore he's important because be honest, we're all a little bit dumb like this. Who, who was your, who was your homecoming king? <laughs> was it the captain of the chess club? Hmm? 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 Probably not. It was more likely than not. Well, who? Captain of the football team. Because he's tall and strong and handsome, and we all want to be like that guy. See, some of you are like, why are you embarrassing me like this? <laughs> I don't make the rules. I just live here. So this becomes a problem for people. This becomes a problem that Hebrews is trying to address right off the bat by pointing out that for as much exaltation as you want to give, and by the way, there's a danger of this. You go to something like Revelation 19, John, despite the fact that he's seen God like on earth and now he's seen God glorified, now he's seeing an, an angel here. He goes, I fell at his feet to worship him. And the angel said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And this is a point that, again, Hebrews Hebrews is building on. It's not just making out of thin air. A subtle little thing that if you're, if you're not paying attention when you're reading would be seen in Luke 1 where this distinction is actually made. So if you go to Luke 1 verse 15, you'll see the promise about John the Baptist. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. So John's going to be awesome, right? He's going to be very important. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll, he'll do the work that God has called him to do. If you fast forward to the promise to Mary, he will be great and he will be called son of the most high. Do you notice there's no qualifier there? It's not that he'll just be great in the sight of the Lord. He's just going to be 
Great. Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. From the very, very beginning, Jesus is presented as something greater, something better, something beyond what humanity could comprehend and truly understand. Hebrews is building on that here. Verse 6. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Now, you should have read that this week because what was our trivia question? Hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> See? Now, that's not, you'll notice it's caps again, which means what? Old Testament quote, if you're looking, it'll come from Psalm 97, but it's fulfilled in Luke. Suddenly there appeared with, an angel, with, the, uh, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased, as was and is fitting. Because if I give you Jesus, and he is the exact representation of God, and he rules and reigns over his creation and is the clearest revelation of God and has earned that status, not just by who he is, but by what he has done, then who should be worshiping him? The answer is yes, everyone and everything. Even those great, powerful, mighty angels, especially those great, powerful, mighty angels, because who created them? God. This is what Psalm 150 reminds you of? Let everything in creation do what? Praise the Lord. That's what you're seeing here is the argument. Verse 7. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? Now, this is an interesting quote, and it's an interesting quote for a, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. I'm going to double check and make sure I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to make sure I don't get a little ahead of myself here. Something I'm going to cover now that will save you a lot of aggravation later on. It's something we've done before. Because I'm going to read this in a second out of the Old Testament, the way the NASB translates. And you're going to go, wait a minute, if, if, you're, if you're still with me. Hebrews does this exclusively. Most of your New Testament does this. You read your Bible in English. Amazingly enough, you speak English, so you read it in English. That doesn't make you bad people. It just is what it is. Now, that means you read a translation. Your Bible is originally written in what we call Koine Greek, which all that means is a big fancy word that means... What I love is that Koine is a big fancy word that means common. <laughs> it's the difference between classical and common Greek. So it'd be like looking at you and going, it's the difference between common English and the Queen's English. So the difference between what Shakespeare wrote in and what you speak in day of day by day, or what the, how the King James is written and how you actually talk. That's all well and good for the New Testament. Your Old Testament is originally written down in Hebrew, except for parts of the book of Daniel and, I think, parts of Ezra or Nehemiah, in which case they're just written down in Aramaic, which is just a dialect of Hebrew. So don't get panicked about that. Now, the reason I have to tell you all of this is because Hebrews is not quoting from a Hebrew Old Testament. It's quoting from the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew of the Old Testament. So what you're reading when you read these all caps quotes is a, an English translation of a quotation of a Greek translation of Hebrew. <laughs> Now, that becomes important because when you translate from Hebrew to Greek to English versus when you translate from Hebrew to English, sometimes you get, you get a little bit of a different sense of word or a different word choice for how you would translate things because there's something in language that we call semantic range. So if I tell you punt, you could, some of you immediately just thought football. Because, ah, there's a punter in football. Okay, but is that the exclusive meaning of the word punt? No. You could, I could use the word punt as mean to give up. Because why do we call him a punter? Because what, is the, what are they doing with that possession? They're giving up on the possession and giving the ball away. So the initial meaning of the word doesn't mean to kick, but it means to surrender. So if I want to translate, so if you wrote the word surrender and I wanted to explain it to somebody, I could use the word punt. But somebody else might use the word give up, or somebody else might use the word hand over. So that's the semantic range of words. So when you go from Greek, or sorry, from Hebrew to Greek, you've entered into that semantic range. And then when you go from Greek to English, you're back into that semantic range. Whereas when you go from Hebrew to English, you only did it one time. You with me so far? See what I mean when I said we could get lost in all of this for an entire Sunday, and I'm trying not to do that to you? Now, I tell you that because 
that's going to matter when you compare quotes that you read in your New Testament to what you see in the Old Testament. Very, very, very rarely, although it will happen, you will have completely different word choices because the Greek Septuagint is working from a different manuscript than your Hebrew that came into English. Now, does that change the meaning of anything? Not really. What it means is that your disciples of the New Testament age were reading a Bible that they trusted from God, rightly so, and were then translating and quoting accurately. Does that always mean that the Septuagint was right and the Hebrew was wrong? Maybe, maybe not. Does it mean sometimes that the Hebrew is right and the Septuagint wrong? Possible. However, the sense becomes the same, and the importance is not necessarily which translations you preferred or which usage you prefer, but what do you do with it moving forward? And that's what we're going to try to see right here. So, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And here's your example. So, Psalm 104, which is where that comes from. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. Did, did you see the, trend, the semantic range being chosen there? You're like, you didn't say the word angels. No, I didn't. What's an angel? Like, what is an angel? It's a messenger from God. He makes the winds his messengers. <laughs> you see where the Septuagint translated it as angels, which is why we're translating it as angels here in English, whereas the Hebrew kept the idea of messenger. So you saw an emphasis on who the messengers of God are in the Septuagint that you don't see when you go from Hebrew straight into English because they're trying not to give you an interpretation. Now, that's why I tell you not to panic about this. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Most of it's easily understood. There's a more important part of that. Despite the power of the angels, despite the things that they do, did you notice the emphasis of Psalm 104? Let me read it again real fast just so you can catch this because this is part of what's applying to Jesus here. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks with upon the wings of the wind, and he makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. What's the point of those four verses in Psalm 104? The power of God. This is something else you'll have to get very comfortable with in Hebrews. Um, there's a pharisaical and a rabbinical way of utilizing Old Testament quotes, and this is an example of it. The point of this verse isn't necessarily just this quote. It's that when you see this quote, you remember what else? It's like when I look at you and go, Davidic Covenant, do you immediately think... Oh, that's 2 Samuel 7, verses 6, 7, and 8, and then you start reciting those verses? No, you think, no, 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 God has promised a king to reign. So you think of the concept. That's the same way the quote's being used here. It's meant to remind you of this psalm, and this psalm is about what? The power of who? The angels? God, that in spite of the greatness of the angels, in spite of who they are, in spite of the mighty power that they demonstrate, like I've always told you about Satan, for all that he can do and all that he does do, He's a dog on a leash. And who holds the end of every leash? God does. It's meant to remind you of the sovereignty of God in how the angels fall second to Christ. Because who is Christ? He is God in flesh. So, all of that to now say, verse 8. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the righteous scepter of his kingdom. This is going to be fun. So, just as the angels fall behind God, they fall behind Christ. This is a quote from Psalm 45, verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now, pause for a second. Did you catch any messianic understanding or implication in that verse? Yeah, if you're nodding your head, you, let me read it again. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Does that sound like they're talking to God or a guy God is going to give power to? <laughs> See, you say yes, because that's what Hebrews said, but Psalm 47 is talking about God. Why is Hebrews now applying that here? 
because of who Jesus is and what Jesus does. So again, how do you understand the Old Testament in light of Christ? How do you understand the work of Exodus, the work of the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, all that God does and has done for his people? How do you see that in light of Christ is what Hebrews is trying to do. So it's not inappropriate to look at an Old Testament quotation and say, that's about God. Yes, it means it's about Jesus. But, but, but it's not talking about the Messiah. It's talking about God. And the difference is. <laughs> and that hurts our brains because we go, because again, very Western thinkers. It, you should be. You grew up in the Western world. It's not, doesn't make you bad people. It doesn't make any of us bad people. We go, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's different. No. <laughs> but they're different persons. Yes. So that makes them different. No. <laughs> I have a headache. Good. Now you're starting to understand the Trinity. <laughs> See, unless, unless there's a little spot like right here that's twitching and pulsing a little bit and, and making you slightly nauseous when you think about the Trinity, you're not thinking about the Trinity correctly. Just so you know. Okay? If it doesn't start to trigger a migraine, you've done it wrong. <laughs> so are they different persons? Yes. Are they all God? Yes. So they have different jobs. Sort of, but they're accomplishing the same work. Absolutely. There's no division, no disunity, but they, have, they are different persons. Absolutely. See, that's where that, that spot right there. It's just like, okay, I don't... This is why Psalm 40... I wanted to say 47. I knew that was wrong. Psalm 45 gets applied because, wait for it, the early church had to grapple with this. And this is where, if you want to have some real fun getting lost in the weeds... Every, with the exception of one, there's one exception to this basically, and it's Gnosticism. And that's because the Gnostics are just, the best way to understand Gnostics is just go, okay, what do the weird hippie dudes out in the desert smoking stuff think about Jesus and God and religion? And you've understood Gnosticism. But every other heresy of the early church is basically what we call a Christological heresy. It denies or distorts some aspect of the nature of Christ. So the biggie from right off the bat would be like Mar uh, Marcionism. So Marcion is a heretic in the second century who looked and as he was reading his Bible, he goes, Jesus in the New Testament is such a nice and awesome guy. I like him. And then I read about God in the Old Testament and he seems very angry and upset with people. <laughs> so that's got to be two different people. And so he said, Jewish God, evil, angry, bad, Jesus, nice, happy God who saves people. And then he divided that through the Old Testament away, through all the Jewish stuff in the New Testament away, basically kept like parts of Paul and some of the Gospel of Luke. What could possibly go wrong, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you had Ebionites who tried to go back basically like the initial Hebrew roots movement because Jesus had to be hyper Jewish. You had Docetism, which, okay, there's Docetism or Docetism, depending on who you're talking to. And that one, it's either that one, oh, my brain just stopped. One of them denies the deity of Christ, one of, the, one of them denies the humanity of Christ. And in a nutshell, they're all trying to subdivide who Christ is and how he functions. And when we get to things like when I say the hypostatic union, fully God, fully man, one body, or you get to the Nicene formulation of God being what we call homoousios, or of the same substance or nature with God. These are all answers to heresies that are trying to divide Jesus from God. The reason why humanity tries to divide Jesus from God is because that makes sense in our brains. Is we look at Jesus and we look at God and go, okay, there are two. Now how do I make sense of that? Whereas the Bible keeps telling you what? They're not, because Jesus keeps revealing what about himself? That he is God in flesh. So again, we talk about building on Pauline theology, you're talking about things like Colossians 1. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together." pretty unequivocal and that comes from a former Pharisee and Paul who would really really have struggled before the Holy Spirit changed him to understand Jesus as God so the reason this quote is pulled out is because this is a quote praising God which means we should apply it rightly to Jesus because Jesus 
is God. Therefore, anything that could be applied to God can be applied to Jesus. This, by the way, is very useful for you when you go out into the world and be like, well, you Christians are supposed to be nice. And it's not very loving to judge people or condemn them to hell or tell them their sin is going to be judged. And go, okay, you, 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 you do know that Jesus was there when Joshua was commanded to wipe out the Canaanites, right? Not like Jesus was taking a nap that day and God did that on his own. And Jesus was like, whoa, wait, what'd you do, Dad? What'd you do? That's not how this works. Or my other favorite is, who killed the 185,000 Assyrians? What's your first answer? What popped into your head? No, because who did, who did God send to do it? He sent an angel. And everybody knows that story, right? The angel comes down and kills 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Um, I think it's 2 Kings 19, or it's 1 Kings 19. Read Kings, it'll do you good. The angel of the Lord is who comes down and kills the Assyrians. Those of you that have been paying attention in Genesis on Wednesday nights, who's the angel of the Lord? Jesus. That's God in flesh come down. Jesus comes down and goes, Assyrians, you have outstayed your welcome. You have to die now. He's the agent of God's creation. He is the agent of God's judgment. This is who he is. This is what he does because he does the work of God. More on that in a minute. So, of the Son, he says this, verse 9, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the, with the oil of gladness above your commandments, above your companions. If I could speak English, we'd be all set. Now, Jesus' work mirrors God's work because it's the same work. And that, too, is a quote from Psalm 45. But rather than Psalm 45, verse 6, this is a quote from Psalm 45, verse 7. Don't you love it when that happens? You you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. Now, we don't read them when we read Psalms, but if you went back to Israel, all those little titles, they would have read that. That was part of the Psalm. It's, it's important. That's why your English Bible preserves them. Um, psalm 47 is a psalm written at the wedding of the king. <laughs> Now, this is where it gets real fun. Why, pray tell, would you go and grab a psalm written for the king of Israel's wedding and pull a quote praising God for his righteousness and power and apply that to Jesus and then pull a quote praising the king for his righteousness and the blessing of God and apply that to Jesus as well? Doesn't that seem out of place and inappropriate? Now, this is where you get fun, because this is where your introduction to what Hebrews is going to do a lot of for the rest of the book is very important. What's the purpose of the king in Israel? Like, don't, and I don't mean like he's ruling the kingdom, he goes and fights the battles. Like, why does that dude exist? Why is there a king? What is he supposed, what's the overarching, most important thing he can be doing day in and day out? Representing... God before the people. He rules on the behalf of who? God. Go back to the beginning of this chapter. We talk about Psalm 2. What's it a warning against? The rulers who are rebelling against God. That they do what? That they repent and come in alignment with the work of God. This is what the king of Israel is supposed to do. He's supposed to rule on behalf of God. So when you go back, and it's something we've done before, we've done a bunch on Wednesday going through Genesis, you see this constant... Um, tripartite uh, work of all the representatives of God. So you see this with Adam, you see this with Noah, you see this with Abraham, you see this with um, Isaac, we'll see it again with Jacob when we get there. You have prophet, priest, king. What's Adam supposed to do? He's supposed to rule on behalf of God, he's supposed to instruct all the people in the work of the payments, he's supposed to offer himself as a sacrifice. That's the work of the king and the prophet and the priest all in one. They're all supposed to be doing this. When you get to the kingdom of Israel, so you get past Saul and you get to David and Solomon, you begin to see that work no longer accumulated just in one person alone, but divided out somewhat. You have a high priest. You have the priesthood being instructive of the people in, in delivering the message. When they go astray, you have the prophetic message coming in, and you have the king ruling over the people. The king is supposed to be the representative of God's dominion for his people. That God rules. He's in the temple. He is seated on his throne. He has his viceroy, though, that directs and accomplishes his work on behalf of the people. People. Hebrews is taking that idea and applying it directly to Jesus because that is what Jesus does and who he is. Now, why do you take that from a wedding psalm, a song celebrating the wedding of the king? Oh, what's marriage? 
Do you see why I say Hebrews lines up really, really well with Pauline theology? Because it's Ephesians 5 that tells you what's the point of your marriage. To mirror what? Christ and the church. The sacrifice and the purification that Christ accomplishes and the submission and following after that the church provides. It's a picture of the gospel ministry. It's a picture of the work that Jesus has done and is doing. So when you're talking to the church about pictures of the king and how they're supposed to live in light of who Jesus is, a picture of the king of Israel and a picture of his wedding are two amazing pictures, which is again why... You would see things like um, Isaiah 61 be quoted. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of, year of the Lord. Now, Jesus read that when he was in the temple, or in the, in the synagogue. He stopped there. It continues. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. See, Jesus pauses there because that part of the ministry isn't coming yet. But everyone in the synagogue, guess what they knew? that that was the second half. This is why they're forever asking, when's the rest of it? When's the second part? When's the hope? This is why you see Peter quoting from Joel and reminding them about the day of the Lord being imminent because Jesus has accomplished the first part. He's accomplished the salvation. Now you're waiting on what? The judgment and the consummation, which is coming when? Whenever Jesus returns. Same idea here in Hebrews. So, been anointed, verse 10, and you, Lord... In the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they all will become like old like a garment. Like a mantle you will roll them up, like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Now, that's a whole bunch of quotes that come from Psalm 102, which is a song of crying out for by those who are afflicted and oppressed, hoping for the deliverance of God. Who wants to hear the punchline of Psalm 102? too. Because I do. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. What Hebrews is again laying out. Jesus, fullest revelation of God, better than the angels, better than any created power, no matter how great you might be. Why? Because he has redeemed, and he has accomplished redemption for his people, and he is doing what? He is securing them for a final coming kingdom. So as they cry out to him, their hope is what? That the good kingdom that God has promised is a good kingdom that Christ has promised is a good kingdom that Christ will deliver. Verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And the answer is none. Because they're not worthy of that because they don't have that kind of power or authority. Who does? Psalm 110, which is where this comes from. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch out, will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. Now, why do we never quote that part? Because that's what the Holy Spirit delivers day by day. So because Jesus has been promised a kingdom, because he has accomplished it by his great work, the Holy Spirit then does what? Indwells the people, changing the heart, renewing the mind, so that your life is lived how? Sacrifice unto God. So when God goes, hey, I need you to do this, you say what? Okay. You mean they volunteer freely because his power has stretched forth? Again, the quotations are meant to be pulled out so that as you read your Old Testament, what the early church would have viewed as Scripture, the only Scripture they had until the Apostles' writings are written down, how do you read it in light of who Christ is? You see the promises and work of God as fulfilled in Christ. You see the work of the people of God as fulfilled in the work of the people of Christ. What do we call the grouping of people who are the people of Christ? That's the church. That's you. That's what you do. That's what they did. There's nothing new under the sun in this. Hebrews is again laying out, how do you live in this world that hates God, 
that hates Jesus, that misunderstands him, that gives you tribulation and persecution every chance it gets, that tries to pull every other ideal into it, and now you are trying to make sense of all of this history, all of this accomplishment, all of this prophecy. What's the key? What's your Rosetta Stone? And the answer is Jesus. I see everything in light of him, who he is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do, which is why verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Yes. Yes, the angels are. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. But are they like Jesus? No. You want a great picture. We can contrast, well not contrast, but you can compare the idea that Hebrews starts out with. So where does Hebrews 1 present Jesus right now? Do you remember where he was at the very beginning here? Um... I lost my, when he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus is what? Seated in heaven, waiting for the final consummation of all things. You want a great little picture that compares with this. Because aren't the angels doing the work? Aren't they ministering? Aren't they accomplishing all of this? Acts chapter 7. When they heard this, this is Stephen's testimony, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, why'd Jesus get up? Because what's Stephen getting ready to do? Die. And when Stephen dies, where's he going? Now, wh who's going to secure his place in that kingdom? Jesus. Which means, even though Jesus is seated because he has accomplished salvation, when Stephen's coming up, what Jesus got? He's got work to do, doesn't he? So he does what? Stands up to accomplish his purposes. The angels are great. They're working. They're accomplishing everything that God has given them to do. Not like Jesus. Christ has accomplished. Christ is accomplishing. Christ will accomplish his work. That's the beginning of Hebrews, making sure you understand that everything from this point forward, you want to apply it to God, you can apply it to Christ. You think the angels are awesome? That's wonderful. Jesus is awesomer. And that's the foundation that you build everything else moving forward. Because at the end of the day, who's the cornerstone that we build our lives on? It's Christ. What's the, ten what's the conclusion of the testimony of Scripture? It's Christ. Christian, where's your hope? It's in the accomplished work of Christ. As we took communion this morning, I said what? All that he's promised, all that he has laid out, is everything that he will deliver on behalf of his people so that you can be at peace. Let's pray.